uh, together will be, just a second here. I have to take the recording off of the screen and now I've got to move everything. There we go. All right. Uh, well, that would be a banner. And if you're in those groups with, uh, with the groups that are planning on being at Banner, I know Kyle is planning on teaching. We'll be at Banner. So we'll have some great food and great fellowship. That's at 10 o'clock this Thursday. And in a month from now, we're going to be in Monette uh, for that PLT. And that's the 15th. So if you're part of those two groups, uh, that's the 15th in, in Monette. Uh, DCPI is coming the 2nd and 3rd of December, and uh, we're looking forward to a great teaching time, learning time on that. If you're going to be starting anything new, this will be this will hit you just perfect, whether that's a recovery ministry or a Sunday school class or planning a church. So it's just a great time for us, and uh, so it'll be churches, planning churches is, is the name of it. Then the Christmas banquet is the 5th. And we'll have some great prizes and a good time for everybody. We hope everybody can come. Feel free to bring your staff, people that you work with. Um, we'll, we'll be able to take care of everybody. So we hope that you can come and be a part of that. Then at the first of the year will be the Daniel Fast. And so uh, every pastor should have the Blackaby book. And um, if you don't have one, and we're, we've given them all away, but... Um, you can, you can go online, you can buy some of them, and they're not that expensive if you'd like one, but it's a really good book. Um, I had a guy call me today, and he is um, he's actually doing some leadership stuff out of it, so it's kind of a cool thing, and um, hope you can grab that book and, and uh, start reading it if you haven't already read it, and then we'll look forward to a great time with our Daniel Fast, trusting God's going to do something cool on the district. Then today I got an email, and um, so this is from Compass. This is the group that will um, give you $5,000 to help you out with your debt. So what's really cool about this is I just got off the phone with uh, Larry McCain, and uh, so the invitation will come to you. You'll either, you'll all get it uh, maybe tomorrow. I don't know if uh, Angie's going to send that out, but um uh, so here's how it's going to work. They're going to pay for you to go to Oklahoma. They're going to pay for you while you're in Oklahoma. And then um, you're, you'll do two or three things. And then you get $5,000 to pay against any debt that you have. And I said, well, I have a car debt. Can I get in on that? I was like, can I, can I get in on that? And he said, Phil, Phil. He said, if you're really nice, maybe. I said, no, I'm just eating. So um, if you have, if you have debt, you want to get in on this campus, or I'm sorry, Compass, C-O-M-P-A-S-S. -S. And uh, so we'll be sending that email out. But if you have any debt, uh, this, you go over for the week weekend, they'll train you, teach you. And basically it's money, money handling is what it's about. And um, then you'll have a chance at um, getting that money and put it on debt. So that sound good to anybody besides me? Okay, cool. So uh, take advantage of it. It comes your way. All right. All right, let's get started. Uh, I'm kind of excited about tonight. Uh, this lesson comes from all kinds of people. Uh, so I don't do anything that's original. Um, but um, so here we go. All right. So building great teams, building great teams. Number one, be the kind of leader people want to follow. Be the kind of people People want to be the kind of leader people want to follow. So, uh, and you know this already, but people don't like following people they don't like, all right? And so if there's characteristics that you have that you, you, you know aren't the best, all right, you're going to have to make those adjustments um, if you want people to follow you in that process. And what's interesting in that is that you have to, and this sounds almost um, kind of... Um, all about yourself, but you have to like yourself so you can be liked. You have to like yourself so you can be liked. Now, Rhonda has this little look that she gives to me when I start talking down about me. Like, for instance, if I say stuff, you know, I'm just not a good leader or, or I make bad decisions or 
that always happens to me, or if it's going to be bad, it's going to happen to me. Rhonda has this look and she looks at me and I know that I just crossed a boundary that she's been trying to get me not to cross. All right. I don't know how many of you are like that. So uh, learning to um, self-talk yourself uh, uh, and quit talking about yourself in negative ways, but talk about yourself in positive ways. So liking yourself so you can be liked is really important. And this one, of course, makes sense. If you don't like you, nobody else is going to like you, right? If you don't like you, nobody else wants to be around you. Nobody else is going to give you a, their, their time of day. So if you're struggling with self-esteem with some issues like that, I, I want to encourage you in a really strong way to relook at that process and say, okay, uh, God's speaking my life. Let me, let me hear what you want to say. All right. When we talk about that, then we, we talk about people first follow the person, then they follow the plan. Now, John Maxwell said that years ago, and he may have, knowing him, he probably got it from somebody. But people first follow the person, then they follow the plan. So people like authentic people. Uh, they, they don't like people who are playing a game. They don't like people who are um, kind of carrying an image. Now, so this, everybody, I think everybody here will understand this. In my age group, when we had our pastors, um, the pastors were not what you would call um, see-through, all right? In other words, they had a partition that you could see, but that's as far as you could see. They weren't authentic in one way. And so they didn't let you into their lives. And so if, if the pastor and his wife had arguments, you would never know that. You would never know that they were having problems with their kids. Uh, you would never know that they made bad decisions in their life because in those days, uh, the pastors had an image and the image was, hey, they were perfect and uh, they're going to stay that way and they're going to create that image. Well, in, in today's world, I think um, our people want to see authentic people and they want the pastors to be authentic and to be honest and to be open. Now, there is a, a fine line on that. Uh, but I, I think if we can be more open with our people, I think people will like that better. Allow people then to thrive, even if they are different than you. Um, I have found myself, and you probably don't do this, but I have found myself making judgments about people before I knew them. So I've seen people that maybe didn't wear the right clothes or their weight wasn't right, or their looks wasn't right, or wrong nationality, or something like that. And I began to make um, judgments or thoughts that were, I think, were uh, limiting them in all of that. And so I'm trying to get to the spot where um, I don't do that. And so if I don't do that um, to people, then I can um, accept them as they are, and I can love them. And then I can give them opportunities to thrive wherever they're at and do whatever they're doing and do it well. Does that make sense with everybody? I'm going to look up on the screen. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. All right. That Okay. So the next one is be the same in a large crowd and be the same in a small crowd. Um, when, <laughs> early on, one of my friends came to hear me preach. And... Um, and he was, he actually he was been out of shape about it because he said, uh, you preached like, like, I don't know who you are. And I, I, that bothered me. And so he went on to say that you, you were preaching like somebody I don't know. And we talked about that. He was pretty off. He was pretty um, belligerent about it. And it was kind of like, Ooh, okay. But what I did realize is I want to be the same in a small crowd and in a large crowd. I want to treat everybody the same, uh, whether you're rich or poor, right clothes, color, all of that. I want to treat people right. I think, I think when we treat people right, that makes us better leaders, okay? And even if somebody comes into your church and they don't have the right clothes on or whatever, um, I think it says something about who you are. When you don't treat them the same way that you would treat the visitor that came in 
with a thousand dollar suit and he was driving a Mercedes and you saw the car come in. If you treat him different and you treat the, the, the girl or gal that doesn't have the right clothes and doesn't look right, I think there's going to be tension. And so the goal is for us to treat everyone the same, okay? I think that's what Christ would do. I think that's the call to us, okay? Now, Jake Blankenship worked with us. And so if you, you should have, I think on your worksheets, you have a, you have a second sheet. Is that right? Hopefully you have it. It has like stair steps in it. Did you print that off? Yes. Chris has got it right up there. Okay. It's going to look, let me put it up. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Do you have that? Okay. You're going to need, you'll want to, you'll want to print this off later on if you don't have it. Okay. This is the sheet that was similar to what Jake, um, Jake was having problems that night. And so um, this is the five levels of leadership from John Maxwell, okay? And um, it's been done a thousand different ways, but I want to run over really quick tonight about, because it's the way we treat people. So the bottom of that sheet is the position spot and it has to do with rights. And so here's what happens. Sometimes we think because I'm the pastor or I have a position in the church that I'm the leader, okay? And I, and I have to tell you, that's uh, as far from the truth as, as it gets. The fact is, I was talking to a pastor last week and I said, you know, you may think you're the leader, but you're probably not the leader of the church. In fact is, I think I know who the leader of the church is and it's not you. And I named the person. And that sat for a little bit. And then... Um, you know, as we were talking, if you've heard John Maxwell talk about this is, so I'm going to give you the quick story, quick version on this story is, so he goes to his first church, he meets everybody, um, he goes to his first board meeting, and if you've heard this story, uh, you, you know, just hang in here with me, but he goes to his first board meeting, and he has this agenda, and he's all ready, and he prays this prayer, and he starts talking, and he talks, and he talks, and he talks, and he talks, and he talks. And then when he gets done, he said, does anybody have anything else? And an old farmer raised his hand and said, uh, uh, Pastor, I think uh, we need to do this. And then he looked over so-and-so and, -so and said, you need to take care of that. And we need to do this. You need to take care of that. And then the third thing, he said, you need to take care of that. And everybody, everybody got all that? Okay. All right, Pastor, you can close this in prayer tonight. <laughs> all right. So he said, I realized all of a sudden in that board meeting, I was not the, I was not the leader of the church. So I went out, he tells the story, I went out to Claude's farm and I said, Claude, I really appreciate you and thanks for letting me come out today. But I don't know if you've seen the front door of our church, but the front door of our church is falling apart. It's going to fall off the hinges. It needs to be painted. It looks terrible. Claude, if we could just get that door painted, oh, it looks so much better for new people coming in. Next board meeting. He was going through the deal, and he said a couple things. He said, okay, now, does anybody have anything? And Claude raised his hand, and he said, yeah, I, I got one thing, Pastor. Has anybody seen the front door of our church? Why, it's falling off the hinges, the paint's peeling. It looks terrible. We've got to get that painted. And so he looked over at a couple of people, and he said, now, look, Next Saturday, you bring this paint, you bring the brushes, you bring the screwdriver. We're going to get that thing off the hinges and we're going to get it painted and we're going to make it look good for new people. Everybody got that? Everybody, yes, sir, we got it. All right, Pastor, you can close us in prayer now. Third board meeting goes out before the board meeting, meets with Claude. Claude's out feeding the pigs. If you've heard him tell the story, he's out feeding the pigs. Claude comes over to the gate. Claude. Have you seen the front of our church, those two rooms? Why, they're filled up with stuff, and we've got little kids. Why, it's a safety hazard. Clark, we've got to get those rooms cleaned out, get that junk out of there so we can have Sunday school for our little kids. Clark, have a good day. We'll see you next week. So, and of course, they go to the board meeting. John Maxwell says, here's a couple of things. All right, anybody got anything? Claude raises his hand. And he does what you've heard John do a thousand times. 
Have you seen the front of our church? Why, it's so crowded up there. We couldn't get a kid in there, and it's a safety hazard. Now, we've got to get those two rooms clean. And so he goes through, and he assigns, bring a truck. You bring this. You do this. We're going to clean this up. We're going to paint this, and gets it all done. Looks at the pastor, says, okay, you can close us in prayer, pastor. Fourth board meeting. He goes out. He had been downstairs. Now, if you've ever heard him tell this story, this is the part that gets hilarious. Because he talks about the frogs were croaking and the crawdads were crawling in the bottom of the basement because it had water on the floor. And he said, why nobody would put their kids down there with the frogs croaking and the crawdads crawling. Why, it's just a hazard. We've got to get that mess cleaned up. God, have a good day. Fourth board meeting. Tells us stuff. Says. Does anybody have anything else? Claude says, Pastor, I do. Looks at the board. Have you seen the downstairs? Why, there's frogs are hopping and crawdads are crawling. It's a safety hazard down there. We've got to get that cleaned up. And he went through again, and he signed everybody a thing to do. And next Saturday, they all came and cleaned out the basement. So John Maxwell takes that story, and he simply says, he learned that he was not the leader of the church. Claude was. And once you learn who the leader is, then you can lead. Okay? So if you're leading and you think you're the leader, but you're not the leader, uh, you need to find your Claude. And you need to go out to Claude's farm and have a conversation before you have the board meeting. So we call those times the meeting before the meeting. Okay, so that deals with this, this last, this bottom position. The, the next one is permission. It's when people follow because they want to. So um, they like you. They start, they're thinking you're leading them the right way. The third one has to do with production. They see that you're producing in the church. You're seeing souls come to Christ. Things are going well. They follow you. The fourth level has to do with uh, you are reproducing. So you're creating disciples in your ministry and the life of the church and things are going well. So you, you do that. The fifth level is the pinnacle of the respect. And it really uh, has to do, he said, few people get here. You know, the Mother Teresa's, the Billy Graham's. He said, those are the kind of people that get to these levels. So there's, there's you a quick run over of those five levels. If you want more, you can go online. And you can read more. There is actually a couple of books that have the five levels of leadership in them. And um, he used to actually do an a, entire uh, conference uh, time, uh, a two-hour talk on this thing. So it's all out there. And if you want it, I hope that you can go out and get it. Okay? So number two is we need to get a vision that people want to follow. So my, my sample here, is, or my example is, listen, I don't know if you're familiar with what's called TED Talks. They are 20-minute talks, and then they're rated by thousands of people, and then you actually can go online and go, the top, I, I want to watch the top 10 TED Talks, and you can watch these talks. They're almost all memorized. They're uh, very carefully done. And they have information that's unbelievable in it, okay? The reason why I'm encouraging you to go to watch one is, is to watch how the pastor or the leader or the talk is delivered, okay? And then, and this is miserable for us to do. We watch, I watched myself a little bit this last Sunday. So every time we do this, it's really uncomfortable for anybody watching yourself. Um, but... You can't get better if you don't watch yourself. So um, involved in this, you can watch yourself and realize the things that you do and the things that you don't do. The TED Talks will show you a really good model of what that's like. Uh, another model is um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Uh, if you're not familiar with that story, there was a conversation with, if, if, if you watch it, you, you can if you watch it and you know what you're watching for, there is a lady standing behind Martin Luther King Jr. in the speech. And you can see he's having, a, he's having a tough time in a spot. And if you read her lips, she will say, Martin, 
Tell them what you told me last night. He drops, he goes away from his paper and all of a sudden he lifts his head and he gives <laughs> the I have a dream speech. Okay. One of the most incredible speeches. What happens? It was his heart. And so as you speak and as you lead, people are going to look at your heart and your heart will deliver all of that. Okay. So com communicate a vision, let it come from your heart. And then I want to remind you that vision leaks. Bill Hybels did a beautiful image of this years ago. He put a bucket. Anybody make homemade ice cream here as a kid? Anybody turn it with, okay. So you have the, you have the salt hole, you know, that comes out, all, all the, the muck comes out of that hole. So as a kid, you know, it was turn, poke the hole, get the ice going, let the salt come out. And as a kid, you always, you always thought you had to taste that for some reason. And I don't know if you've ever tasted that, that much salt in one moment, but it is not a good experience. All right. So, so Bill Heibel says vision is like, and his the idea is like the ice cream bucket. It has a hole in it. And no matter what you do, vision always leaks. Now, when I was preaching early on, I thought I was so wonderful that people would remember my messages for years to come, that they would dwell on it all week long, and, and it would be a wonderful experience for all of them. Well, you know, the truth of that is they didn't remember my, I just spilled my water. They, they, they couldn't remember that message Sunday night, let alone next week. It was it was quite an experience for me, all right? So here's what I'm saying to you. Sometimes we think, if I, if I create the vision and I tell them they got it, okay? They may have it, but they're not going to keep it. And vision leaks. So you got to keep talking about the vision and things that are taking place in the life of the church and your dreams, all right? So keep telling them. Number, the next one down, is leadership is ultimately about creating a way for people to contribute to making something extraordinary happen. Leadership is ultimately about creating a way for people to contribute to make something happen. How do you do that? You're asking, how are we going to do that? What are we going to do? What will we need to do for them to make that happen? So as a leader, working with your team, you're saying, how can I help them? What do they need from me? What can I do for them? How can you determine how fast to fulfill the vision? I, I love this question. Because he's saying to us, after you share the vision, then the question becomes, how fast will the vision be fulfilled? And I know what some of us want. Some of us want the vision fulfilled the next day. That vision will not always be fulfilled the next day. It may take a while. In fact, is if you talk to Moses, it may take 40 years. Okay? And so the question then becomes, if I want to see the vision unfurled, what do I have to do to see it done? And that becomes part of your responsibility in that. Okay, number three. Recruit fantastic people to join you. Look for talent in your church where, where you are doing things in the life of the church and you need somebody. Look for those people that have those talents. Um, Jim Collins says you need to have the right people on the right seat on the right bus. Sometimes in church, we have the wrong people in the wrong seat. <laughs> and believe it or not, it's the wrong bus. So if, they're, if, the, if the wrong person's in the wrong seat, Guess who has the responsibility to get them in the right seat? That's you. So the, I want to encourage you that when you, when you realize what people's strengths and gifts and their talents are, you need to help them find the greatest potential where they're at in all of that. Okay. So again, Bill Hybels, when he understood this, he, he looked at how, did I, how do I hire people? And so he said, well, I'm going to hire Christians. And I'm going to hire people with character, and I'm going to hire people with um, competency. 
Then later on, he said, I need people that will work with people. Then later on, he looked at that and said, you know, I need people who understand the culture. And finally, he said, I need people who have a, who have a calling to this. I don't want to just give people or put people in a position that don't have a calling. All right. So when you look at recruiting fantastic people, I would say to you, I would look at people who are Christian, people who are who have character, people who have competency. And do you see, do you have that comment that I have down there beside of that? Don't hire somebody you wouldn't want to spend the time with your on your day off with. When I read that, I was like, whoa. There maybe there are people. <laughs> You know, there might be at one or two people I wouldn't want to spend my day off with. You know what I'm saying? Everybody with me? Or you're like, no, no, not me. I love everybody. I, I just get along with everybody. Oh, you're a bunch of liars. There are people, it's like, when, you, when they come in, you, you're like, oh, man, not today. Not today. So be careful who you put around in your inner circles. People that you can work with have competency, chemistry, culture, calling, those six C's, okay? I'm telling you, those six C's are really important when you hire. And I think they're important when you look at your nominating ballot. And I think they're important when you look at who you're going to pull around as, as um, unpaid staff needs to fit these six C's, all right? If you don't follow these, you will pay a price. I promise you. All right, number four, ask the team for their ideas. Um, I did a thing in seminary, and maybe you've done it. It's a, it takes one hour to do it, and you create two teams, and you have a list of questions of, of survival tactics, and so it's you're given a list of things. You can choose six. You vote on it. Then you come back to the full group and you tell why you chose what you chose and what you've chosen. And the leader says, well, these, these are the six things that you needed out of this huge list. And because you didn't choose the right things, you all died. Okay. Now, in my head, when I'm doing this, I'm thinking, I don't need to listen to anybody else. I don't need anybody's input. You know, I hear what they're saying. They're absolutely dead wrong. They're going to kill us. It's going to be a terrible thing. I'm not for it. All right. So I had my own six. Now I'm in the group, so I got to go with them. But I've got my six. All right. So we go back to the huge group. And he starts listing out for us the six things that we're going to have to have to survive. On number two, I died, okay? And I'm sitting there and I'm listening and I chose four out of the six things that would have killed us, all right? Had we gone on this trip. And I'm telling you, I was so frustrated with myself. I'm thinking, how can anybody be this stupid? What is your problem? And then I realized the importance and the power of the group working together made me better than I was, all right? That was a really tough lesson for me. So I'm saying to you that your team probably has some really good ideas, and they're probably really good people. So ask them for their ideas. Allow them to challenge the process. Now, I don't think, I think that when you come, when you have your vision and it's lined up, I, I think you need to hold on to your vision, okay? I don't think you should ever surrender your values, okay? So when people talk to, to me on the district, it's really easy for me to say, they say, well, you know, what, what, what's important to you guys? <laughs> and I say, we're, we're, we're about three things. Number one, we're about Luke 19, 10. Jesus said, I've come to seek and save the lost. We've tagged it with at any cost, by, or by any method at any cost. So we're about winning people to Jesus. That's our first core value. Number two, we're about developing leaders. Number three, we're better together, right? So those are three core values. I'm not willing to surrender those. I'm not willing to be talked out of those. I, I think those are essential to who we are. So once you have, once God has, you have worked with your church board or you have your vision for the church, 
I don't think you should surrender that. All right, you may change the process, but I don't think you should change the vision process. And I for sure don't think you should change your core values, okay? Now, you have to ask the question, do they have a better idea than I have? Um, if they come to you complaining, then I think they need to have a solution. So when people come to you as pastor and they start griping about stuff, one of the questions you need to be asking is, well, what's your solution? I mean, if you're going to come and gripe to me, what's, how, how are you going to solve this? And if they look at you and they shrug their shoulders, then say, whoa, 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 we need to stop the conversation. You're wanting to gripe at me about something, but you don't have the solution to it. Now, here's what will happen. If you do that two or three times, and especially if you do it and people are watching or people are listening, all right, say in a board meeting, it won't take very long for everybody to stop griping without coming with a solution, okay? If they see that about the third time, they're going to know if I gripe in this board meeting, <laughs> he's going to say, so what's your solution? Now, you don't have to go their solution, but I think you need to ask them if they have one, okay? And then one of the things I'm trying to learn, I'm not very good at this, but I am trying to learn how to do this is lead a discussion by asking questions. Rather than manipulating the conversation, just ask questions about where we're going. You know, why do you say that? Why do you believe that? What do you think that would be the best way? Where, where, where would you take us if you were in charge? So you, you have a conversation, but you do it by asking questions, all right? And then finally, what is the best thing you're doing that I should be doing? I, I think that's a tough question to ask anybody, but it's a really good question. I try to ask the question when I meet with pastors one-on-one, -on -one, I try to ask the question before I leave, is there anything you need from me? I try to always ask that question. But here, it's the question is, what's the best thing you're doing that I should be doing? So if you were with a mentor and you were sharing life together, that might be a question you would ask, or you may ask that in um, inside saying, okay, uh, we're having this conversation and it's obvious that they're doing this better than I am doing it. So what do I need to be doing to change the way I'm thinking and all that? All right, number five, create an atmosphere of encouragement. Ask yourself the question, why do people volunteer here? If you, if you come away with that question and it's um, not a good answer, you know, they do because they have to. They, they're doing it because they want to feel better. Then you need to ask yourself, what can I do that would help people volunteer in a better way with a better attitude? All right. Now, I understand, especially if you're in a small church, most of you feel like you're doing everything and you are like on the edge of burnout. I mean, they're just right there. I get that, okay? But I think as the church grows, and, and honestly, we have so many good stories in all of this, I think you need to begin to ask yourself, what can I do to create an atmosphere in my church that people want to volunteer and they want to help lead? What do I have to do? What do I have to do to change? What do I have to do to lead, okay? So three C's on this one, all right? Community. Love to be together. Uh, uh, when you have good community, they love to be together and they do things so they can do life together. So I would tell you to, to on purpose, do things that they have to do together. Um, Ed Robinson used to say when we were, when I was a youth pastor and working with the youth and um, doing all this kind of stuff at Central, one of the things he taught me was don't be scared of adversity when you're with the youth. So if you have a flat tire, things don't go right at camp. Somebody gets the measles, somebody breaks their arm. He said, actually, you can use those moments to create a bonding in your youth group like never before. So, um, so we go to California with the youth group to General Assembly. We are going to do puppets and music and all this kind of stuff. And the bathrooms. The bathroom in the bus clogged up and we could not use it. And then it started to smell. Anybody ever been on a big bus where the, you've had this wonderful experience with the bathroom clogged up? If you haven't, you're missing life. All right. You really need to get on a bus and, and have this experience. So what happened is 
all these kids that were just griping up a storm, all of a sudden began to pull together to go, well, hey, you know, hang, you know, they're telling each other, hang in there, don't get sick, we'll get to the bathroom. And what happened was it created a cohesion in the group like we had never had before. And I realized that Ed Robinson was right. Difficult times cause us to have, and so in, in a church, you think about this. If you're having difficult times, somebody's dying, there's a cancer, you have a chance to take those moments and bond your church together and make it stronger than it's ever been. Don't miss the adversity that comes from the enemy to use it for good to the glory of God, okay? Use your adversity, those moments, for good. Number two, the contribution. Tie what they're doing to the reality that someone's coming to Christ. So this, I look at this as a value. So when when they when you when they're at the front door greeting and they're smiling at everybody, your words are something like, you know, thank you so much for creating an atmosphere where people want to come into church and where they are open to hearing the gospel of Christ. Thank you for what you're doing. You're tying their greeting to someone coming to know Christ. Okay. So when you the same thing happens when you take offerings. Never, never get up to take an offering and say, uh, you know, we hope you all tithe today and pass the plates. Tie the giving to a story about someone being touched by the church. So whether that's food, coming to know Christ, you made a difference in this family because you gave, because you sacrificed. Joe came to know Christ this week, and we celebrate the goodness of God. What, you, what did you do? You tied what, they, what they're doing to the purpose of your church. Okay, so the purpose of our church should be making Christ-like disciples in the nations, however you phrase that, okay? So for us, of course, it's Luke 19. We're, we want to see, see people come to know Christ, all right? So, so when they, cont they contribute, what they do is important in the kingdom. And finally, their com commendations. Okay, um, I'm learning this. I, I've tried to get better at it, but people like, number one, uh, they, they love to hear their name. Thank you, Joe, for helping us out this week over at such and such. Thank you, Mary, for working with the youth. We know you'd like to kill them, but thank you for not killing them this week, and we had a great time Wednesday night. Thank you, you know, Sister Susie for doing the nursery for 433 years. We could not have made it without you, okay? What are you doing? You're tying their name to saying thanks, all right? People like to hear their name. They love attaboys. I don't know of anybody that doesn't want, doesn't like encouragement from people, all right? So encourage people by saying attaboys. Even Paul, if you look at Paul's letters, even Paul went through a time and he would say thank you before he would close the letters down. In remembrance of you, thinking of you, thank you. He would say those phrases. So Paul modeled for us what it was to say thank you before he would close his letters. So the last thing that I would say to you tonight is be the kind of leader people want to follow. Be the kind of leader people want to follow. What kind of leader do you want to follow? What kind of leader are you? <clears throat> are there changes you need to make so that you can lead better in the days ahead? And if there are, what are they? And what will you do to become better at leading? Because if you're going to build a great team, you have to be a great leader. All right. Uh, I want to take just a moment. I sent out an email on a Monday morning, and I want to take a moment. To, does anybody have any questions on the information that I gave out in that email? I told you that I would take a moment tonight to give you a chance to respond before I pray in closing tonight. But does anybody have any questions on that email? Yes, Fred. Phil, yeah, Phil. Uh, I, I'm newer to the district, but I, I got lost in that recommendation you had of the 
was it Church on the Move? Or yes, you were asking us to maybe look into their their way of doing things, and I was not familiar with that church. Yeah, no, and you shouldn't be. Um, and so, <clears throat> what's going, what's what's happening is Church on the Move. You can look it up, and that'll be great. But it's Chris and Phil Zimmerman. They are from Germany. And I have met Chris, and I'm going to have Chris come over at District Assembly on that Monday afternoon, and he's going to talk to us about what a church does on addressing people. So I'll give you a heads up on this. Okay, you guys will be ahead of the game on this. So if you took the concept, and this is almost always how we do it. We talk about, uh, you know, like if we come up with a, a, a theme for our church, it's like gather, grow, go or something like that, all right? So what we say is you need to gather, grow, then go, all right? Chris Zimmerman agrees with Dr. Gustavo when he says, let's turn it. Let's go, and then we'll gather. Okay, now I'll show you what he's doing so you'll understand. So Gustavo Crocker says, you need to belong before you believe. We've said for years, you need to believe before you belong. All right. They're flipping this on us. So Chris says, how can I build a kingdom? So here's, please don't be offended by this. Okay. I, I'm not trying to be crass on this. So, so what he does is he gets a guy that he likes that plays the guitar with him. And they go down to a bar. And the guy starts playing music. And they he plays for about 30, 40 minutes. And they all say, hey, you guys all have a great night. It's good to be with you. Take care. We'll, we'll be here next week. We'll see you. So the next week, he comes back, and they play and sing and have a great time again. They do this about three or four times until the crowd starts building up because they like the, the fellowship. It's not that the guy's a great musician. It's that the, they're, they've created a fellowship within the bar. You guys all know the one-liner of Cheers, right? <coughs> a place where everybody knows your name. It's the bar. Whether we like it or not, that's it, it's the place that they feel safe. They uh, they wear no mask. It's just who, who I am. So they share life together. So Chris said, we're going to go in the bar. So we're going to play and sing. We're going to do all this stuff. We're going to have a great time. And then he said, now we're going to find a purpose for gathering. So Chris gets up one night and he has created a name for the group. And so he announces the name for the group and they all cheer. Yeah, we're, you know, we're the, you know, whatever, you know, his name. And then he said, okay, now here's what we're going to do. We're going to raise money for a water well in Africa. Woo! We're, you know, everybody's excited. We're going to raise money for a water well. Hey! He said, so I'm going to put a box back here. And if you want to give money, to the well, it's right back here. Every week, the box is going to be there. So what do they do? He takes an offering in the box, in the bar, for the well in Africa. All right? They just don't call it that. So every night, he's, he collects. Now, some of these folks are given hundreds and thousands of dollars for this. Okay? You, you got to understand what's going on here. So he gets enough, and he comes back to the bar, and he says, we have raised enough for a well. Now, who's going to go with me to Africa? Oh, I'm going to go with you to Africa. I'll go with you to Africa. He takes a team over to Africa with the money, and they help build the well. This is the group of people in the bar, okay? Now, what do you think Chris does while they're on this trip? Who do you think he talks about? Of course, he talks about Jesus. And so these guys start getting a purpose for life, and he starts helping them out. So here's what happens. This is a, I'm, this is, I'm not even exaggerating any line of this story. Okay. This is all true. So he keeps doing this month after month. They rate, they built a, well, they've done all this stuff. The barkeeper who, as you know, talks to everybody and everybody talks to the barkeeper about how bad their marriage is, how bad the kids are, how life just sucks. And we hate our job and we hate our, and finally the barkeeper starts saying, Hey, look, I can't help you, but that guy over there in the corner, his name's Chris. Go talk to Chris. Chris will help you with your problem. 
And so all these people who were high on drugs, their marriage is falling apart, they're not good at parenting, they start talking to Chris. Guess what Chris starts talking about? Jesus. Jesus can help you with that. So literally, now this is just in a few years, okay? He now has planted 30 churches. 30 churches. You want me to tell you where he's planting them at? Bars. Okay, now I'll tell you the other half of this story. Please don't shoot me. All right. The same mindset, same guitar. The next place they go is the red light district in town. And he plays and he sings. And the ladies come around and listen. And they, if you hear him first tell the story, they're thinking they're, they, that he's wanting service for the night. And he's going, no, 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 I, I just, I'm just coming to play for you guys. And then he starts coming back because he goes to the bar and he gets them to give them things the ladies need. So they need deodorant and they underwear. And I mean, he went through the whole list, things that I would never have thought of, panties, bras, uh, deodorant, toothbrushes, toothpaste, combs, um, wash rags, all this stuff that I just, I never would have thought of. And they start bringing him to the prostitutes. And the same thing that Jenny Norega does when she goes down to feed the homeless is what they were doing for the prostitutes. And so the prostitutes start expecting them to show up. And then they start talking to Chris and to Phil about their needs. And guess what? They tell them that Jesus... That Jesus is the only one that can meet your deepest need. And those ladies in the red light district are coming to know Jesus Christ. And he's planting churches in the red light district. Well, all this is all coming. I've met Chris and I've heard him give the talk. And now I've talked to his supervisor and we're going to jump in with this group and we're going to make a commitment here real soon. Well, God's been dealing with me about district assembly. And I know I've tried to make district assembly a raw, raw moment. And I've tried to really cheer all of you on to just take hell with a, you know, with a, with a water pistol. Just go. Charge hell. Let's go. But this year, a few months ago, I feel like God just said, this, will, this is going to be different, Phil. And so here I have this story. And I, I ran across a song. It's sung by a lady, and she talks about the church across the street, and this just rips my heart out. The song's about a girl who lives across the street from the church, and she's going out, she's decided to have an abortion. So, it's so the first verse is about before the abortion. The second verse is about the abortion. The third verse is after the abortion. And she's talking about the church across the street never knew uh, about me. And I'm thinking we can't have churches across the streets that don't know about the girl who's going to have the abortion. And then I have this song that we're probably going to we're probably going to have sang. It's called "This Must Be the Place." This must be a place where grace and mercy are reached out to people. This must be the place. So it's not going to probably end with a hoorah this year. So <laughs> brace yourself. But what I want more than anything else, I want us to walk out broken before the Lord. That we want to reach people for Jesus like never before. With a new passion and a new drive. So that's a really long answer to a very short question, Fred. And um, I hope that helps. Helps you out with the um, who Chris Zimmerman is. So it's Church on the Move out of Germany. Out of Germany. Okay. All right. Yeah. I looked up because of where I'm at and my Google search went right to Tulsa. There's a Church on the Move there. But yeah, no, so it's I, not. I didn't get to them. Okay. All right. Yeah. You type in Chris and Phil Zimmerman, Church on the Move. Um, they'll all show up. 
another director, another name you could throw in there is uh, Ed Means. Um, and so Ed is the one that was with um, Life Church last week, uh, two weeks ago now. And he's the one that gave me the information about Life Church is saying we're 40% down in numbers. And we've had three months of steep decline in giving. And they're, they're thinking maybe something's going to happen. Robert Morse down in Texas told the leadership group they are preparing for a year of decline. They have a year's worth of income in savings in case things go really bad. Um, so I don't know if that's going to happen or not. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but um, so I wanted to give everybody that information. So you're just aware of, you know, we don't know what's going to happen um, financially across the nation, um, with all that. But uh, at least ways you have an idea of kind of where we're going with uh, now you now you know now you know kind of district assembly and the questions that we're that we're asking it's good well that gave you that was more than what you asked for wasn't it Woo! um okay so any any other questions that you had out of that email that email went to everybody as far as i know i think i i tried to shoot that to that went to everybody as far as i know if you didn't get it, let me know and we will resend that email because um, I would want everybody to have that email, whether you're a pastor or not. All right. Any other questions? You guys are full of grace tonight. You all have hung in here with me. And so thank you. Very good. I'm trying to look at the screen here. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Then we'll go. Jesus, we love you. We're, uh, we're amazed at your grace in our lives. And so this day, will you help us to be the leaders that you want us to be? Will you help us to lead in such a way that others would want to follow? Forgive us when we have not led well. Forgive us when we didn't say and do the right things. Forgive us when we didn't seek you. So tonight, help us to be leaders that can build great teams for the sake of the kingdom. And Father, I thank you for Chris and Phil Zimmerman and their church and their dreams and the way they're looking at things. So God, would you help us to maybe begin to think about how we could look at life a little different. Rather than asking people to come to us, we can go to them and do it for your glory. Would you watch over and protect these who have joined me tonight? And would you, would, you, would you multiply their time? Because they've surrendered this time to you. Would you multiply their time in other ways? Would you restore them? And if they're feeling discouraged, would you restore them tonight? Would you touch them? Would you give them hope tonight? That the God that we serve is a God of hope and a God of power and a God of strength. I pray, Father, that there are things going on in their marriages, in their homes, in their kids. Father, we surrender all of our kids, and we surrender our marriages, and we surrender our dreams to you. We surrender our past to you. We pray, oh God, you would work in all of it to your glory tonight. Give us hearts that beat with your heart. Finally, I pray, uh, I pray against the enemy tonight. God, would you hold your mighty hand up against the enemy who would try to get into our minds and to get into our hearts and to create situations that are not the best and change the way we think and to change the way we think about ourselves. Father, would you hold your hand against the enemy tonight? And in the name of Jesus, I just pray victory in every church, in every pastoral home, in every leader's home tonight. I pray victory for them in the name of Jesus. Give them what they need from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords tonight. Release the power of the Holy Spirit to break through in situations that look impossible. Release the Holy Spirit to come on their lives and to give them what they long for in their hearts as they pray for these loved ones to come to know Christ, as they pray for healing in their marriages, as they pray for their churches to rise up against the enemy. God, grant their hearts cry tonight. I pray, God, you would sweep over them and fill them and use them in the days ahead 
in such a way that you would be pleased and would bring a smile to your face. Now we give to you, we give to you tonight, we give to you all that we are and all that we are not. And I think sometimes we feel like we're more of the not than we are the are. Change our thinking, change us, and use us for your glory. In the powerful name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we pray these things tonight. Amen and amen. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. And uh, may God richly bless all of you. All right. Have a great evening.